always check carefully, make sure she hasn't slunk across in the tracks have crossed the road. Now, Linda's wondering, is there a leopard that I haven't seen in some time and would really like to see today? Indeed, there is, Linda. Yeah. His name is Gajima. And we don't see him too often. He only holds territory right on the edge of our traverse area. So I'll see. It's a branch, but I'll show you what I spot. Okay, VM, uh, a little bit to the right. Okay, so those tall marulas there. Now you see there's that one branch hanging down. That, you always check that, or if you ever see sort of some dark spots in a tree at a distance, it could always be a leopard kill in the shed. I'm just checking all the marulas there at the moment with my binoculars. Also, always important to have a little listen. You never know if... Oh, what are these impalas spotted? I, oh, that's another impala. <laughs> It's good to just check, check, check. Now, one of the most important tools you have out here is a good pair of binoculars. Let's see, there's that impala. Can you see him, One impala way over there. Oh, these guys look like they're about to have a silly five minutes. Chasing each other about. Look at them go. Now, what I'm listening for now is that alarm call. Sort of <laughs> the alarm calls of an impala. Oh, these two males, they seem to be looking up towards the head. Let's go have a look there. If we get no luck here, as I said, she might be in here, but she might have also gone slightly further to the west. Oh. Check one with heavy. Heavy, heavy. Any luck there, Mfo? Okay, copy hips. I think I'm gonna follow now to that large toma that's in that drainage line there. Uh, I'll have a look from quarantine side. Okay, guys, I'm gonna go for a walk and and see if I can find her. I've got a feeling she's gone straight towards, which she's done many times. Is that an entoma? You heard me say, which is a jackalberry. It's that big jackalberry in the middle of the river there. And I found her around there many, many times. So I'm going to have a walk down there. While we do that, let's go see uh, what the tailor's up to. And we are back, everybody. 
Look at that beautiful tree that we have found. It seems to be the only thing that we're able to find today is things that have got roots in the ground and cannot move. <laughs> Having a good chuckle that I cannot find the tallest creature. I don't know where they've disappeared to, but there are a couple of thick blocks in here, so possibly they've gone into one of those. But we'll keep doing circles and laps around until they eventually come out. However, I want to show you this lovely big tree. Now, it's a very famous tree. I'm sure I don't need to even tell you what it is, but for the new viewers, this is a Bellanites, or a more common name, is a torchwood. Now, this is actually a really big one. This is quite a beautiful one. And something that I love is the way that the trunk twists and turns. It's, it's quite beautiful. It's actually a very handy a little tree, this, to have around, especially if you, if you know it. Now, if you find the seeds of uh, this tree, there's no fruit at the moment. But hopefully, oh, can I see one? Can you see on the branch over here, this little one that's coming towards us? Maybe it's a dried leaf. Can you see what I'm looking at? So. Let's see. We're going to see if I can show you. I think it's a fruit. I'm not sure. It's very difficult to try and keep it. Is it one? Yes, it is. Look at that. That is the fruit, everybody, of the Balanites. Tree. Well done, a downpour Dave, on spotting that as well. That was very good. That was very hard to zoom in. It's very small, everybody. It's probably about the size of your thumb in length. Now, I don't. The fruit. I've never actually eaten the fruit before, but I'm sure things like porcupines and all sorts of and warthogs and things will munch on them and baboons. However, I want to tell you about the seed inside of that fruit. Now, that seed is actually very flammable. And you can use it, you can light it quite nicely and um, use it almost like a, a burner, give you a bit of light. It will burn for quite a few hours. So you need a lighter to light it or somehow or you can be like Steph who attempts to make a fire and uh, who's pretty amazing at uh, doing such a good job with two sticks by being able to make a fire. I can't do that everybody. That's quite amazing. It's really beautiful. <laughs> David, you are spot on with uh, the name of this tree. So David said, is that why this tree is called a torchwood? Because it burns well. That's exactly why it's called a torchwood. Because of that seed inside the fruit. Now, I was saying to you that some of the animals uh, can eat it. Remember, their digestive systems are quite different to ours. However, I wouldn't eat it. It's quite, quite poisonous. And I think you'd get quite sick. I've heard stories of them using it as a, a fish poison. Um, as well. So so don't eat the, the fruit of uh, the Balanites tree, everybody. Rather stay away from that. We're quite sensitive um, to that. But I just wanted to point out this lovely tree because I missed you all and I was gone for such a long time. And this is a tree that one day I will see a leopard in. Actually even to see some baboons in this tree would be quite nice. It's nice and open. Lots of branches to uh, dangle off as well. Good climbing tree as well. But I'm not going to climb it for you today I'm afraid. Right, let's carry on and see what we can find. Maybe those leopards are around. Now there's lots and lots and lots of animals that I have yet to see and I've got a checklist. I've still got to see uh, some of the Birmingham boys. I have only seen the sticks pride once and there are plenty of leopards that I need to see too. Now I know Linda you're asking me what are there any leopards that I'm dying to see? I'm dying to see the Anderson male. And the reason why I cannot wait to see him, and I hope that I do get the opportunity to see him, hence why I like to hang around on the southern boundary to hopefully see him sneak across, is I've heard stories that he could possibly be bigger than a leopard by the name of Mbavala, which roams in the Sabi River. So quite close to the Paul Kruger uh, gate for the Kruger National Park, and then also the southern sands, all the the lodges, Lion Sand, Sabi Sabi, all those places down south uh, that border along um, the Sabi River. Now he lives in there, and now I think that's the biggest leopard I've ever seen. His his sort of common name is Vin Diesel. That's what we like to call him, but his real name is Mbavala, and he doesn't have a neck. He's it's just dewlap, and he when he's eaten when he's full, uh, you you look in a distance, you look on the rocks that are all in the Sabi River. You'd honestly, first thing, and I've done it before where I've gone, oh, lions! No, not lion, leopard. 
he's that big. Now, I, I believe that the Anderson Mail is a contender and there are, uh, have been many disputes as to who is larger. So I'd, I'd love to be able to see him for myself and, and decide, seen as I've seen Mbavala in real life. So I think I'd have an accurate idea of who is the larger of the leopards. Oh, we've got a lilac-breasted roller. Just perched so nicely with the sun in our favor. Look at that. Hello. These aren't these just gorgeous birds. There we go, everybody. That would make a lovely screenshot. A nice uh, desktop background for you for, for the day. And it's nice to have uh, this roller around all year. We don't have too many pretty birds that uh, stick around, I suppose, other than the, the Turocco, the pur purple crested Turocco. But the other rollers are seasonal, so we normally only see them in our summer months. And I'm hoping, and I don't know, maybe you can all help me. Have any of you ever seen a broad build roller up this far north? Now, we used to get them down in the south, but I used to see them a lot in Zambia they were uh, quite prominent in that area so I'm uncertain if you see them up in the northern sands and then of course we see the occasional purple roller flying past which is quite nice not as pretty as the lilac rested and off it goes now you've just got some moss on the tree and <laughs> some not moss lichen wonderful lovely bird he's actually just flown a little bit further ahead and perched himself on a silver clutch cluster leaf we might get another look at this bird Come on, he's very chatty. He's actually making quite a bit of noise. Maybe we get lucky and see it do a bit of a display. Shane, I've been avoiding this uh, way. I've been avoiding and hoping that someone wasn't going to ask me if I managed to find the hornbill feather. So, <laughs> David and I, let's watch while I tell you. Let's see if this lilac breasted roller is going to hang around. So, David and I very quickly hopped out and we thought we knew exactly which tree. It was in an, and we can't find it and I don't know why and I'm pretty sure it was a feather that fell out of that bird. I could be mistaken though but maybe you can all help me. Did any of you see the, the same thing that I saw? Did you see the feather dropping from the bird as it was preening itself? Now I'm going to have to go and have a look again this afternoon after breakfast. Ah, hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go and try and have a look again, but I believe that uh, some of you who possibly had a better look and uh, were looking at the screen, I was sort of looking at the birds in, a, in the distance and uh, <laughs> said that it could have been bark, which makes sense, it could have been bark. I'm, I'm hoping that it isn't there, because I did see just before it took off, oh, you're going to fly? You're getting ready to go. I did see it sort of open its wing and groom, and I thought maybe it pulled out an old feather that was ready to fall out. But possibly, I could be mistaken, like I said, I was looking into the sun and I was watching the actual bird, so it was quite far away from us. Luckily, David has a nice zoom on his camera, which is obviously proves to be quite handy. But I will go and give it one more look, because to find a hornbill feather, a southern ground hornbill feather, wow. I don't think too many people have found uh, too many hornbills in their lives. Too many hornbill feathers, sorry, in their lives. I'm so distracted. And the reason why I'm distracted is because I've got some impala, everybody. Let's have a look at the impala. Okay, we've got a lovely herd in here. And I also saw this little steenbok sprint through. I can see it. So maybe we'll be able to get to the steenbok too. Oh. Darby, I think let's go forward because I can, that steenbok looks like it's using the restroom. Now I want to see if I can show you something interesting about a steenbok. Can you see it in there? Uh, yep. No, no, no! Oh, I'm just missing it. Don't run, don't run. Keep scraping. So many trees. Can you get it through there? Yep. Ah. So you can see it running away everybody. Now what I was hoping to show you is just that the vegetation was a little bit thick is that the steenbok actually defecated. So tiny little round pellets and they're really small. I have to try and find you some and compare them to impala feces because they're tiny. But what the interesting thing is is how you differentiate between common dacre, dung and steenbok dung is that once the steenbok is finished defecating, it actually scrapes 
and covers its dung with sand which is quite amazing and it many it did that but it was I just we weren't at the right place at the right time unfortunately so it's something that we'll hopefully be able to show you again let me go forward again let me see if uh, we can maybe get a better view but I don't know but it was really really quite spectacular and the reason why they tend to cover their dung with it's so hard the stem book doesn't is it all right no, it's going forward again let's keep going forward we're trying to find gaps in and amongst all these silver cluster leaf trees and the bush willows. Can you see it through there? So they cover, there's many theories as to why a steenbok cover their dung with sand. One is that they hide the scent because they are such a small little creature and they're quite vulnerable. And the other one is that it actually preserves the scent because these little antelope mark and defend territories can you believe that something that small has a little territory and i know jamie um said i think it was yesterday that she thought it would be quite funny to see two female steenbok fighting butting heads and i was thinking about that the other or last night and i thought that'd actually be quite hilarious to see that i can't imagine anything like it you can see them nibbling away looking up always listening very vulnerable creatures and that's why they're on their own like this is because they're so small it's easier for them to try and hide away and and pretend that they're not even around rather than being in a big herd where they would be picked off by big eagles by the leopards by the hyenas by the, even the jackals and the serval i'm sure could get a very young steenbok And now they're munching. Oh, now this one is munching. Right. I think let's uh, carry on. And see what else is out and about. But I'm sorry that we didn't get to see that steenbok going to the toilet. Got to see all the different animals using the luxury facilities. Now here is a perfect, a perfectly good example to see the devastation that has been caused because of the elephants. Now you can see lots of trees have been pushed over. Like I said, they have to do it though uh, during the winter months. It's very, very important. Like look at this little bundle over here that's been pushed over. And they're doing it for food. So it's not that they're being destructive. Nine times out of ten when they do it, they need to get the roots. They're stripping the bark, all those sorts of things. And the reason why I don't think elephants are that destructive is now you can see they've pushed this entire tree over. But can you see how it's actually provided quite a bit of shelter? So your ground dwelling birds like the guinea fowls, like the spur fowls, like the franklins. Even a little quail. Now if it's trying to run away from something like a big eagle that's soaring in the area or if it's being chased by a jackal, I don't know, whatever it may be. If it runs under here, it's got a really good hiding spot and it's also a good spot to lay your eggs. Nice and kept out of the sun so it doesn't get too hot and... And with with African sun beating down on it, and you've got safety. I think it's. A, I think the elephants help a little bit. So our beard wants to know: Do we have any Akori bastards? Now, unfortunately, up here I've never seen a Cory bustard, and I've never, I've actually never seen a Cory bustard at all. I've seen lots of video footage. I've actually even found a feather of a Cory bustard once, but I have yet to see one. Now I know they occur in the Kruger. Now I'm wondering if they'd maybe come this far north. I'm unsure. Should we have a look at a book and see the distribution? Now I just need to find the page very quickly. So the Cory. Cory bustards, everybody. That is the heaviest flying bird in southern Africa. No, you're going to be a little bit further down. 154. My favorite of the bustards, though, mm, I have to say, I like the Denim's bustard. You used to get that down in the southern, uh, sub, southeastern section of uh, South Africa. Okay, we've got some bustards, we've got the black bellied. Wow, have a look here. So the Cory Bastard is the one up top. Quite spectacular. 
And if you go down one, you can actually see the denims busted, which is my favorite. Now the denims busted is the second largest busted that we see. Much, much um, lighter though, however, than the Cory Bust. The Cory Busteds get big. They get up to about 18 kilograms. That way, it's a lot. I, when they come land, when they come into land, I've, like I said, I've, uh, I've never seen them in real life, but I've seen lots of video footage of them. It sounds like a Boeing, a big aeroplane coming into land. It's, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard geese sort of swooping in um, about before they land in the water, and it sort of sounds like a jet coming in. Now, we'll times that by 10. And that's exactly what the Cory Busted sounds like. So, I've never seen Denims Busted up here. But, I've, like I said, it's the second largest Busted that we get, the, the Denims Busted. And they only get to about 14 kilograms. So, quite a sort of weight dis, uh, difference. There's quite a bit. But in terms of uh, wing uh, height, not so much. The, the big Cory Busted can um, stand at just over a, a meter. Maybe a little bit more. And the denim's busted just less than that. But quite nice. Very cool, huh? Bird book. Now, we've been seeing a lot of red crested corons, and it's something that I've never been able to see yet doing the, uh, their display, which I'm quite excited about. Also, only seen photos and seen lots of video footage, but haven't seen them doing the display for myself. So it's also the time of the year we should start to be seeing it too. And I've heard a few of uh, the red-crested corons calling, and they like this area. This is a very good area for the black-bellied bustards, and uh, as well as for the the red-crested's. Maybe we see one around here too. I think I just maybe heard one in the distance, but it sounded very far behind us. We'll have to just keep a keep a lookout. Oh, I can see mongoose, but I think they're very far away. Mongoose, can we see you? Let me go back. Can you see them all racing in the distance? Well, they've gone to that fallen log. They're actually all racing around in that fallen log. Back there we go. Here we go. You can see them. Now. Kalinda, I wonder if Kalinda is watching today, everybody. So Kalinda asked me a question. I need to just get the, exactly get the question a few days ago, and I felt terrible because we didn't really get a good look uh, look at uh, these um, mongoose. They were sort of around for only about two seconds, and then they disappeared. And, and Kalinda asked a question now. I just want to read it word for word because I did write it down. I said I was going to get back to you, and I try and keep my word wherever I can. And this is the first time since about oh about four or five days now we have actually seen any mongoose where is that question it's here somewhere let me i'll be two seconds everybody i want to get it correct oh, where did i write it down i thought i wrote it in the front of my book oh here we go so Kalinda wanted to know sorry Kalinda, i don't have the question anymore but i remember you asking essentially about um there, those mongoose are coming out again. Basically, you were asking, do the mongoose sort of show affection for each other? Do, do they care about each other? I can't remember the exact wording that you used. And I said to you that I wanted to actually sit and watch their behavior. Now, here's a perfect opportunity. They've woken up. They've come out of their termite mounds. Now, let's watch how they interact with each other. And I'd like to hear your opinions before I give you my, my answer. Do you think that they interact nicely with each other, so sort of grooming each other, helping each other find food, fend off predators, or do you think that they just do their own thing and they don't really mind too much about the other members? Now, there was a little, there's some interaction going on now which should be able to answer your question. Look at that. You see how they've all cuddled up now? See how they've all been grooming each other? Allo grooming is the most important thing for strengthening a bond between groups of animals that live together. So Kalinda, they indeed, and I hope you're watching so that you can get your answer eventually, they are very sociable creatures and they've all got different types of personalities. 
We'll have some that are probably a little bit more tolerant than others. We see that with all the different animals. But look at them, all cuddled up now, grooming each other. When one finds something, they let off excited noises and they all come running in, try and grab whatever it is. Especially if it's something like a snake and they need protection, they'll mob it. They'll try and chase it away. Or birds, small, uh, also uh, birds of prey. I've seen them all coming out and trying to chase one away. Unfortunately, they didn't get lucky though. The, I think it was a what was it a dark chanting goshawk actually managed to get a very tiny little dwarf mongoose, which was unfortunate. But they tried, but it picked it up and it moved away with it. But look at all of them there; they're quite happy. I can hear a Cokie Franklin calling in the distance. And they're behaving quite nicely now. Obviously, us, all of us guides, we we know mo quite a bit about the different animal behaviors. And the reason why I didn't answer Kalinda's question when she'd asked, I told her just to hold off on it, was just because I actually wanted to watch the relevant behavior. Sometimes it's nice to, <laughs> look at those two on the bottom right playing. <laughs> you see that? Sometimes it's really, really nice, though, to to see the actual interaction, to understand the behavior a little bit better. And that's what I, I like to do. So I'll always try and get back to your questions and I will write them down. I just don't know where I wrote that question down. And I think that was a much better example. Actually being able to see it. I'm sure ba most of you who are living in the States or, or see things like ferrets and weasels. They don't, they, don't you think they look very much alike? And I know Liz thinks so. I know she thinks that they look very similar. And they're actually in a similar family. We just don't have weasels and things here. Everybody, we've got mongoose, which are quite nice. So thank you, mongoose, for coming out. Because I haven't been able to sleep very well. Because I've been trying to find some mongoose to get that question. Watching those mongoose play around now with all of each other and David Ryan would like to know are they all siblings or are they from different families families now David it, it just depends uh, there is there is one there is a hierarchy system to mongoose there is one pair that's more dominant uh, than the rest but the others are able to to give birth as well however if it's not a direct bloodline so if it's not a sister or a daughter of uh, the dominant pair of mongoose that female may actually go and uh, kill the pups so a baby mongoose is actually called a pup so most likely that they would have been siblings sort of uh, directly related to each other and they all sort of stay around there's lots of males lots of females a bit of everything really but really really nice little animals to sit and watch if you've actually got the time I've sat and watched mongoose on my own accord two hours sometimes. Watch them waking up, sort of poking their heads out of the termite mound and then coming out and carrying on with their foraging that they'll do during the day. Right, well, we're going to carry on just checking these areas. We're still in the area of where these leopard tracks were. And while I keep searching, maybe we find the giraffe too. I think let's hop on aboard with Brent Leo Smith and see how his morning has been treating him. There are impala everywhere throughout this area, so hopefully one of them spots that leopard and starts snorting away. So I had a walk into the little river system there. I checked around one of Kula's favorite spots at the Jackalberry. Uh, unfortunately, no sign over there. Uh, we're going to loop around again. Herbie's still on foot. In here somewhere. Now there's a possibility she maybe isn't as far into the block as we thought. So I'm going to just go very slowly, check all the trees as we drive through here. Well, there's Herbie. I'm going to have a chat to it.
Where is she? Ah, somewhere around. <laughs> She's beating us today. There'll be no breakfast for me. No breakfast yeah. till you find the leopard. Yeah. See, that's why we love Herbie. He's so committed. Yeah. No breakfast for Herbie till he finds Karuna and Cubs. <laughs> okay, um, we're gonna check next. Yeah, I'm gonna go. I, I lost the checks in here, so I'm gonna find my Okay. Yeah. She didn't cross, huh? That's what uh, I want to check. Ah. They've been. Too many more right yeah. Okay, maybe I'll go back. I'll go in Paula Plains, Paula. Yeah. But she's definitely somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. yeah. So where do you think I should? Yeah. Paula Lands. Did you check um, Philmon's deep? Root. Okay. And no one's driven there yet today. The we were the first mover to drive there. Yeah. Because I did check that side. There's no sign for them coming. Okay, thanks, Hip. Welcome. Enjoy. Okay, you too. <laughs> Oh yeah, so we're gonna get oopsie. We're gonna go check around just in case she managed to sneak across the road and headed more in a westerly direction. But a Queen Karula up to her tricks. She is an incredibly difficult leopard to track, but the fact that the cub tracks are here as well, there's a good chance she's got some meat somewhere in this area. Okay, so while we search for Queen Karula, of course we're gonna look for anything else we might see and uh, if we see it find a nice flowering knob thorn always a good spot to check for sunbirds incredibly beautiful little birds I can hear him calling. Sometimes they can be incredibly difficult to spot when they're calling. A red crested core on. Have you got him, Vim? Yeah. Oh, Vim's got him. Hello. Come on, do your suicide dance for us. It's the right time of the year. Now, hopefully, if he calls again, he might extend that red crest for us. No, and he's deciding to be shy. <laughs> Hiding behind the termitaria. Just double checking the tracks here, I'm making sure Karula hasn't come back this way. But Herbie's on it. And one of couldn't ask for a better man to be on 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 foot looking for the Queen. I think they're watching the car behind us. You heard some kudu that were staring into the bush, but I think they were watching a vehicle that was coming up behind us. Let the vehicle pass. They seem to be in more of a rush than we are. But while we wait for the vehicle to pass, let's go across to Taylor, who's got a feathered friend. We have got the greatest bourbon in this area, the Scotia Brachypetalis, or the weeping bourbon. You can see it's lovely and it stands out. It's got lovely green leaves. Now we're going to have a look. We've got lovely red flowers, but I can also hear a greater double-collared sunbird chirping away that is somewhere 
jumping in and amongst these branches trying to feed on these lovely flowers and I know Brent was just trying to look for a sunburn it seems I have beat him to it now I just need to get him to sit still so I can show you so I'm just keeping my eyes out oh I saw him where did he go he's somewhere there oh who's that no that's a that's a crested barbet there was a big one where's the sunbird well there's lots of birds here everybody sorry I'm trying to look at the tree to try and figure out where it's jumping I can hear it now he's gone quiet everybody he's hiding from us now oh, everybody's hidden but there's a lot of birds on this tree anyway okay well when one of them decides to sit still I'll be able to show you but it's a very easy tree to identify because obviously it's very tall it's got lovely green leaves and now it's bursting with this lovely red color and you can see from the flowers now things like sunbirds and any of the other nectar feeders who love to come and feed on this tree and I think that was the sunbird that just flew away that you possibly saw just passing uh, the bottom right corner of your screen because that sunbird has gone very quiet now but I'll keep I'm keep listening for it now something else that's quite interesting about this tree is it's got lots of different uses the wood is very hard it makes for fantastic furniture it's quite, almost like a, ch uh, a dark chestnut color the heart of the wood if you can't see that unless you've got x-ray eye vision and now you can also use the bark of that tree to actually make dye now if you see an elephant scoring um, but I don't think this tree doesn't look like it's got any any tusk marks from an elephant the bark is actually really red underneath and you can you can dry that out and mix it with a bit of water and obviously crush it down to a powder and then you can make a lovely dye from that which is quite nice and one of the most famous things about this tree is the fact that they have these wonderful little seed pods that develop on them now you get many many different species of scotias and this particular one. Oh, I saw one. what else was fluttering out. I, saw, I don't know if you saw what did we got there. That's our crested barbet, everybody. It's also eating away and it's gone to the other side of the tree. I don't think we can see it now. But as I was saying, there's many different scotias. Now, I want to tell you about one that they that I get down in the eastern Cape of South Africa, so the southeast coast. That's a Karoo Burbin, so the scotia Afra Afra. Now, down in the in the south where the settlers were first arrived they actually would take those pods and they would roast them and they'd use those beans to make a coffee substitute obviously I don't think it's got a very high caffeine content to it but nonetheless they used to drink it now they didn't quite do that with this tree up here what they do here is they just roast the seeds and then they eat them and that's something that they learned from the Khoi Khoi people which I found very interesting but I'm hoping, hoping that the longer we hang around here, we're going to get another sunbird to come through. There's not many flowers around at the moment. It's not knob thorns that are flowering. The acacia xanthophloas, the fever trees, and then of course the bourbeans. And we've seen a few monkeys, ta um, baboon's tail over the last few days with flowers on and a couple of morning glories. But there's very, very little that these these um, birds are able to, to feed on. So I thought that this tree would be covered with sunbirds but apparently not and you're really all just going to have to take my word for it uh, that we saw a greater double collared sunbird maybe I shall show you a very quick picture in case you have no idea what I'm talking about sunbirds we've got to go to S everybody mm -hmm. that, that would help eh? yes. then we've got to go to G so 410 is the page I'll be two seconds I'm getting a little bit better at this I need to start memorizing these pages Ta-da! Oh, I need to let me hold it up a little bit. Sorry, so it's in the sun. No, not that one. This is the one we were looking at. Quite amazing, hey? Beautiful green, big red band on its stomach, a little bit of blue. You only see that depending which way the light is shining on the bird. But a very easy one uh, to to sort of see. Something that you can get quite confused with is if you go a little bit over to the right. See you there? The southern double collared sunbird. They look very much the same. This one is just slightly smaller. And then the big band of red is not so big on this one. And earlier, we actually saw another a dull colored looking um, a sunbird. And I presume then, if we saw the male great double collared sunbird, it was possibly the female great double collared sun, sunbird that we saw. But there we have it, everybody. 
We've done quite a bit of birding today. Maybe we'll find some mo more uh, baru <laughs> karoo bur beans uh, for, for some more birds. Now I know Marianne wants us to try and uh, go and find uh, the Wahlberg's eagle's nest to see how those birds are doing. We can definitely make our way over there. It's going to take us a little bit of time. But Marianne, for you, we'll go and investigate. Of course, of course. <laughs> North. But while I head on over to the Wahlberg's nest to see how our local pair is doing, let's go see what Mr. Leah Smith is thinking about this morning. Well, we've looped around the whole of Impala Plains. No sign of Queen Karula. I'm just going very slowly down the, the power lines here. Herbie's in the bush over here somewhere. And uh, I think if we get no tracks, I'll let Herbie do, work his magic and uh, see what else we can find. Now, awesome that you saw a double collared sunbird with Taylor. Hello, June, who's another first time watcher. Welcome to the Safari Live family. June said she's enjoying the show, but she's very curious and would like to know how fast a leopard can run. Well, June, a leopard at top speed does around 24 meters per second, uh, which is about 90 kilometers an hour. Just over 90 kilometers an hour. Oh, wow. What was that? That left track. No, it was the hyena track that's been half driven over. Now, for those of you who are new, we are live in the middle of the African bush, and you can ask a question just like June just did by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or uh, you can pop an email to questions at wildo.tv. I'm going to take a gamble now. And I think there's been quite a lot of vehicle traffic up and down and around here. So it is possible that this leopard we are in search of managed to cross one of these roads. And she does like to head towards Galago Pan. So I'm going to have a little gander past the pan. Oh, lots of new viewers this morning. Wonderful. Hello, Hollywood Baby. Now, Hollywood Baby would like to know, is this an enclosed national park? Uh, it, 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 is, it isn't, it isn't. It's, it's quite complicated. It is an open system. Uh, to give you an idea, it's eight and a half million acres. Uh, but there is a fence to the west and that separates the community lands and the tribal lands from, from the reserve. But we are open to the Kruger National Park and this is actually a transfrontier park and uh, it encompasses three countries. So South Africa, Zimbabwe and Mozambique. But it is amazing that, uh, of course we can't drive over that half, eight and a half million acres and we're in a private reserve that is open to the national park and this private reserve is called the Sabi Sands Game Reserve and if we had to go a little bit more specific we're on Juma Private Game Reserve at the moment which is one of the reserves within the Sabi Sands Game Reserve. And Karula often likes to sneak through here and down towards the pan so we're going to go have a little look there Doesn't look like anyone else has driven here yet, so fresh canvas to work on to look for tracks. Oh, 
always check these prominent game paths coming in. Now, <laughs> uh, John said, if I had to guess, how many termite mounds would there be in a one square mile? Well, John, that is completely de dependent on the soil types. So, uh, in an area like this, there probably aren't that many. But in an area like Cheetah Plains, on the sandy soils, uh, there are going to be a lot more. Oh, it's gone. Oh, here we go. I'm listening to Herbie. Okay, it sounds like Herbie's got tracks heading this way. Okay, so it sounds like Herbie wants us to check just up ahead. Herbie, I'm at that, uh, very close to that junction now. I'll go have a look. Okay, coffee, yeah, I do, do remember that. Okay, I'll go and have a look. And he says that the tracks are heading north, so they could still be behind us, that's why we're not seeing tracks here. I still think she might have snuck across here. So what we're going to do is we're going to check via teller access, which is this main road up ahead here, very carefully. I'm going to check down to the edge of quarantine. If we don't see any tracks there, then I'm going to head back to the west. So there's a couple of big game paths that come through here. This being one of them. Okay, so we're checking those. There's another one. Okay, now no tracks so far. This is a spot I've seen crew across many times where the ground's quite hard. So just checking very carefully. Uh, and hello, by Nilo, another view viewer. Welcome to the live African safari. Um, by Nilo would like to know when does a leopard hunt for food uh, during the day or at night? Well, generally from mm. during the night and around sunset and sunrise. But all these predators are are completely uh, opportunistic so they will take sorry the car seems to be being a bit funny um, they will if something happens on them during the day they will try and catch it so they are opportunistic I just want to double check now we're going to check up towards the next road junction and while we're looking for leopards it seems like Taylor's on a birding safari we have got a spider's nest 
as you can see. Now I want to see if there's anybody home. So I'm going to get out of the vehicle very quickly. Out I get. Pull my shorts down. Put my lifeline, my pants. Now everybody, I can't stay unplugged for too long otherwise I won't be able to breathe. So I just want to get a nice piece of grass. And some of you may have seen me doing this before. It's one of my favorite things to do. Now, this spider, oh, it's a, in the vehicle that looked a lot lower down, I'm going to have to stretch. <laughs> and I'm not too short. Now, the community nest spiders, actually, if you come and have a look in over here, can you see that? Looks like something got eaten. Yep. That's just the, the exoskeleton. Now, I'm going to try and touch it. I think I feel as though I need possibly a longer stick now, but I don't want to use a stick because I don't want to break the web. I just want to tickle it and make myself pretend like I'm a spider. Let me let me find something else. Hmm. Let's go with whatever you are. Pull that out the ground. Okay. Let me get a good spot. Let's see if anybody's home. Now hopefully I'm going to come racing out. Normally they do they're quite sensitive so just a little tap. No. Doesn't seem like there's anybody living here. Look how strong that web is, everybody. That's a heavy stick compared to how thin these little strands of silk are. I don't want to break it too much. Let me just pull it nicely. No, don't get stuck on my fingers. But no one seems to be living here anymore. That's disappointing. I hope we we're going to have a rush of spiders racing towards us. But we haven't. So maybe we'll find another one, maybe this afternoon, if we come across one. We shall try and have a look at all the lovely little spiders, because it's quite unusual. Spiders are solitary, most of them, except just a few. And we're quite fortunate to see, obviously, see the community nest spiders. Now, I did hear elephants. We heard them screaming and shouting in the distance. So we need to try and get over there. Dravi, what road do you think they're on? Tundans. Can we get there? Yeah. We can get there. Right, so that's what we're going to do. So, Marianne, I apologize. We're going to get to the Wahlberg's Eagle's Nest. We're slowly making our way there, but I do want to follow up on the elephants. It sounded like maybe there was quite a nice big herd just off to the right. So, we're going to go around that way. It's Sorry, ever I've got to pull my hat down. It's about to blow off. Excuse that rustling noise. It's got very windy all of a sudden. Ooh, a bit bumpy here. Was this our 4x4ing four road? Oh, yeah. Ah, so we always have to do tests on, uh, on vehicles. Sort of just to make sure that you're driving them nicely and driving them correctly. And the other day, Steph brought David and I out here to do our, our vehicle testing. And this was exactly the road. Did I do all right? Yeah. Have I improved? I so. Thank you. <laughs> it was just quite funny because I actually asked uh, uh, David the other day, I said, what was that road that we did all that uh, 4 by 4 ing on? Though it's not so bad anymore. It seems as though they've repaired it slightly. Though this one is looking worse for words. Bumpy here. Okay, so... I'm going to try and locate on these screeching elephants. Hopefully they're not going to be too upset with us and we'll be able to have a look at them. And Marianne, we're also going to be going to this Wahlberg, Wahlberg, Eagle, Wahlberg Eagle's Nest at some point. We're getting there slowly. So while I navigate through these windy roads, I think I'll head on over and see how Brent is doing. So, well, Hebby's asked us to check the access road very carefully, so that's what I'm doing. Oh, Kim's pulling over for me. Now I'm going to check. There's a couple of big animal paths up ahead near Aubrey's Road. And if we get nothing there, then we're going to head back. Hello, Jim. Where's the leopard? Oh. Hey, William, nice, nice scott over there. Yeah. Okay. Let me see, William. <laughs> So look, William, William, of course, one of the trackers, he's, 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 he's rolling as a, a traditional headdress there. Say hi, William. Hello. <laughs> there we go. 
Tiens, c'est bon. Allô, Bolé. Allô, Evan. Allô, Mamazi. Here we go. William looking quite dapper today. Hi, uh, Jason. Jason would like to know whether we can identify male and female leopard just by their tracks. Well, we can definitely identify that they're a male or female. And, uh, here we go. There's a pretty bird, but it's not being very kind to us. Here we go. Being very quick today, and little white helmet strikes. There we go. There's one. They are insectivores. William, I'll get back to your question in a second. Once we've finished looking at these beautiful birds. Oh, there we go. I also eat quite a few spiders. And I've even seen them collect spiders' webs for their nest. And off they go. White crowned helmet shrike. So, William, uh, yes, we can definitely identify between male and female. Male is much bigger. As for individual leopards, it was Jason, sorry, Jason was asking that. Um, Karula's tracks I know very well, and they're very small for a female leopard, and uh, that's what gives her away. Just double checking here. That's all hyena tracks. So there's one more animal path I really want to check before heading back to the area where Herbie is. And it's this big one that comes here towards Aubrey's Road. Uh, no sign, so let's turn around. But uh, so Karula's tracks are very, very small, so I am able to generally see those. Also, it helps when you see two other sets of tracks with her um, because it'll be the cubs. And even though probably young Hosanna, the little male cub, his tracks are probably bigger than his mom's already. Animal path, not a sign of leopards. So let's go back towards the east and check in with Herbie. But uh, yeah, the, of course, each individual paw print is different, but uh, it is the, the difference is so minuscule, it, it's really difficult to tell unless you spend a lot of time looking at that animal's tracks. So, with our Carulo, that we spend an incredible amount of time looking at. I genuinely think I can tell her tracks from another female leopard, but the others are all pretty similar to me. But it sounds like Taylor's got a reptile to show you. Look at this little terrapin looking at us while we are looking at you. Now I'm going to get out because I want to show you how small it actually is. It doesn't look very small now. It's tiny. I thought it was a leaf blowing in the wind. And it's not. Oh, there it is. I almost lost it again. It's so small. I'm not going to pick it up now. Remember, Jamie was telling you the other day why you shouldn't pick up terrapins. And it's because they have a chemical defense. So they have a foul uh, smelling odor and liquid that they will excrete. They're basically, they're emptying their bursa sacs. So it's where they store all their urine and water. And, um, and it smells terribly. And the other thing as to why you don't want to do that, why you don't want to pick it up, is because if they do do that, they, um, and if there's not a lot of water around, they don't drink within 24 hours again, they can actually die. I'm just going to turn it around though. Don't, d don't, no, no. Look how small it is. I've got small hands, everybody, as well. That is tiny. Don't be scared. 
I don't want to eat, but it's very risky actually being out here in the open. I've saw, seen Wahlberg's eagles flying overhead. I've seen yellow-billed kites and all sorts of other things. And now this is a very much in a lot of trouble if you don't move out of the way. Now off you go. Back to the waters where you came from. You're not going anywhere now. Maybe we should take it with. And I'm going to leave it. I'm just hoping that it goes towards the trees. I don't want to interfere too much because this is where we found it. It's obviously left the water somewhere. But it's quite young. I couldn't tell you how old that terrapin is, I'm afraid. When it doesn't look too old, now we've got to make sure that we don't squash it as we get out of here. Look at it slowly moving. It's quite funny. Let's have one last look at this little terrapin. Go, 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 go! Quickly! Yeah, I can hear the birds coming over. You see how it froze there? there were some go away birds that landed in the jackalberry, but don't worry, they won't want to eat you. <laughs> you can see it navigating through the tire tread. And uh, it's, it's not very deep, that uh, tire tread, but it just shows you as to how small this little chap really is. That any obstacle is a big obstacle. Quickly go! Go get some under some trees, hide away. And this again, this would be where the elephants would come in handy when they push over trees. That if it was panicking and uh, trying to race away from a bird or something like that, it could go into a lovely fallen shrub and it would be safe. But it's almost crossed the road, almost home free. He's so, this thing is so tiny, it's so small. I really thought it was a leaf in the wind. And then I got so excited, so excited that probably none of you would have been able to have understood me. I don't even think that David understood what I was shouting about. He's saying, he's shaking his head, he's going, I had no idea. <laughs> I tend to do that sometimes, get too excited and then I start speaking another language. Now off it goes, it's going to move on through these big leaves. Now those leaves are small as well. I think you're quite interested to see where this little chap goes to. And I can just hear in my ear as well that Herbie and Brent are working hard on trying to find that leopard, which is great. Come on, little guy, you're almost there. Keep going towards the dark tree. Stopping, surveying. I can hear something rustling, but I think it's just the go-away birds in the trees. Now, I've seen a female tortoise, not a terrapin, a tortoise, uh, laying her eggs before in the ground. And I've seen tortoises mating before. Now, James Richard wants to know, do terrapins mate in the water or on land? Now, James, good morning. Now, I'm not 100% certain, but I can only imagine that they mate in the water, seen as they are more aquatic. Um, and then rather being terrestrial like the tortoises. So I think they pretty much do everything in, uh, out in, in the water. And they obviously come out and they'll lay their eggs, I'm sure, not too far away from a permanent water source though. Oh, you lucky. You better keep going. Because I see vultures and all sorts of things in the sky. Catching thermals. But I think this little chap will be safe now. It seems to be shaded slightly. Which is good. So lucky you. But it would be, I would be quite happy if um, a Wahlberg's eagle swooped down and ate this little one and took it back to the chicks. I know Marianne would be happy about that this morning. We're actually not too far from the, the Wahlberg's eagle nest. So after here, that's where we're going to be going. We tried to follow up on those elephants. We heard them screeching, but we can't find them. So I presume that they are in the drainage line, which we can't navigate through, unfortunately. So we will leave them be and we'll have to try find elephants this afternoon. But it looks like that Terrapin is home free. Well done. You can have a round of applause. Congratulations. Woohoo! That was a long journey for that little terrapin, everybody. Now, back to the Wahlberg's eagle's nest. I'm glad that it survived and we watched it cross the treacherous Twin Dams Road. Bye-bye, <laughs> little terrapin. Be safe. Quite naughty, wandering around all on its own. No, I'm joking. They, they don't really rely on their... On... <laughs> 
on the adults to look after them once they've hatched they go off and explore the world all on their own oh, a monkey i've got a monkey hello monkey am i too did i go it's a vervet monkey everybody where are the rest of your oh i see them hello monkey 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 i'm so excited everybody there's so many small things around here at the moment which makes me very excited oh well and i see that there apparently are fleas around here too so i hope we don't catch any of those keep away from us monkey just stay there and i'm glad to see that these monkeys are just happily eating and feeding on the vegetation like they should i'm very impressed that i haven't seen too many monkeys hanging around uh, the drc and and plaguing us and trying to steal all our food so that's very good oh my goodness coming right up oh no stole something and then ran straight away what did you get? What's in your mouth? A stick? Oh, well, what are you eating? Is it a root? I can't see what it is. Hang on, we're going to wait. Pull it out of your hand a little bit more. It ra ran over and it grabbed something and is now eating it. <laughs> I don't know what it's eating. But there's like a whole, like a whole root system or something that is out the ground, like the elephants have kicked over. And I wonder if it wasn't a fleshy part of some succulent that was perhaps growing there. But there are a few more. Where is the rest of them gone? Where well, I'm looking for you. I saw one more. I'm just scanning everybody. My head is very busy. No, now I've lost the other. Oh, look at that one up top there dangling. Look at that. Hello, monkey. What are you eating? Looking for little grubs in between the bark are we so this is quite a young monkey this one we're looking at now they're both young they both aren't adults so i wonder where the rest of the family's gone however i don't think they have gone too far now if only you knew where that lovely boer bean tree was you need to go west and there you will be able to eat lots of lovely flowers this is another animal that would feed quite happily on those boer bean those scotia flowers that we saw earlier be much tastier than the wood that you're picking off of this tree that can't be very nice and especially a cluster leaf cluster leaves are full of tannin everyone they're not tasty even on the the greatest of days it's amazing hey you just drive in a circle thinking oh my goodness i'm so sad because i haven't found any animals and then we find a terrapin we find some monkeys I can't wait to see what's around the next corner. Well, I know the Wahlberg's eagle nest is coming up, so I've always got that to look forward to. This one was being quite quite funny. It likes to dangle from the branches, apparently. But where is your family? Oh, and look, this one's run on the other side now. No, he's hiding. Did a daring dash behind my vehicle. Can you, I think you have to go up a little bit. It's going to the top of the... Where's he gone now? He's hiding from us. There is a monkey in there, everybody. It's just... There, there he goes. Now, that is a th third monkey. So they're slowly coming out from somewhere. Where have he gone? No, he's, this one is not posing as nicely. So that's good. So they're around here somewhere. There's a big drainage line. It's a good place to be out of the wind lots of little foods come food coming around lots of flowers and berries on the jackalberry trees However, i don't know what you're going to find up here you're just climbing to the top to survey the area perhaps please do an alarm call for a leopard for me no there's a sulking let's see this little one is coming down from the tree no it's not going anywhere. Maybe we can look at the one that's posing nicely, that's sunning itself on the branches. Very casual. Now normally I love it when the baboons sit on the, the termite mounds. And uh, we call it a loo with a view. So this is sort of something like that. You're a very itchy monkey. You need to get your brother or sister or your mom or your dad to do a bit of grooming. To pick out all those parasites. Look how delicate they are when they climb down. Oh, what have you found there? Some lovely green leaves. Looks like from a vine of some sort. Very nice. 
Now it's, it's very important. I'm going to just remind everybody, if you do come on a safari holiday, or any holiday in fact, please don't feed the animals. Rather just let them be in this there's perfectly good amount of vegetation around that they can scavenge on and forage for. They're well capable, as you've seen. They can dig for things. Because if you feed them, it you unfortunately make them become reliant on, on humans for food. And that's when they can become quite aggressive. If you say, yes, 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 you can take, and then you decide that you don't want to feed them anymore, that doesn't work. Then they get very upset. So rather just let them be. And always keep your windows and doors shut, otherwise they will come and raid your room. They're very intelligent little animals, especially the vervets. Now David, you want to know why the, their faces are so dark? It's just the dark, it's sort of, let's, let's have a look. Let's, let's try and do some closer examining. Oh, is that one coming out? No, are our friends all gone? Oh, there he is, back again on the quarry, everybody, sitting out nicely. So, if you look very carefully, and their feet as well, can you see how their feet are black? So there's not very much hair around on their face, it's a lot of it is facial skin. Their hair is obviously grey and more white. So, I can only presume that they have that darkened facial skin around their face, around their eyes, around their nose, around their mouth, which is quite sensitive. It's to avoid sunburn, because they lack hair there. That would be... Uh, my conclusion as to uh, why they have that the black faces Beautiful one. just just the three of them moving around here. I haven't seen any more haven't heard any more. Oh, there's another one at the base of the Yes, Penelope good morning Penelope these monkeys are indeed omnivores So they eat all the lovely green grass shoots as you can see that's happening now look oh delicious they eat fruits, they eat roots, they eat also beetles and moths and grubs and caterpillars. They eat all those little things. Very hungry. Ooh, can't get enough of that green grass. Told you that the animals are going to be absolutely loving for it. You'd swear this one hasn't eaten for a while, the way it was stuffing its face. Now, one of my favorite things to see, even though I said I don't like it when people feed uh, animals, but when you unfortunately do have a raid from a troop of vervet monkeys It's quite funny to see them running away with all the food because Anything that they can put something in they will so you'll see them. Let's talk about muffins We had a you were perhaps uh, Baking that morning and you'd baked a lovely tray of muffins and uh, you'd pack them out put them in a basket to cool and a group of monkeys managed to get in well this monkey that we're looking at would have one muffin in its mouth and maybe two muffins in each hand and it would race away with as many as it could. It's quite hysterical. And then you'd see the rest of them all coming out with those lovely 12 muffins that you baked, all gone, being eaten by the monkeys. Here comes the one more. Where did you go? There he's going to cross just now. He's doing the same thing. It's just behind the tree. There we go. Here he comes. Hello. Yeah, three naughty terrorists. If you've been watching. <laughs> yeah, I think you heard that word and I think that's not the first time you've been called that. If you've been watching when I first started here at Safari Live, I told some very of my moments of being, a room being raided by vervet monkeys. So I love them, but they also are not my friends. But it serves me right for leaving my window open. But they're clever. They've watched them learn how to unlock windows. They are so smart. They only need to go in and try it once. How cool was that? Right. Now, everybody, we need to get to this Wahlberg Eagle's Nest. I think I can see it in the distance, but we're going to go around and try and get a better view. While I do that, let's uh, head over to Brentipu. <laughs> and see if he's managed to find Karula or whoever is wandering around the property. So, no luck yet. Herbie's still on the tracks, but they were heading north into that sort of impenetrable river system. So, well, we leave Herbie on foot. 
We're going to head back towards uh, the Amber Eyed Lioness and that Birmingham. See if there's been any change. I don't think there probably has, but always worth having a squiz. Actually, yeah, the wild dogs have been giving everyone a run around in the north and they started heading south but they've lost them. Uh, who knows, maybe they'll appear out of nowhere. And so wild dogs are very good at doing. Is that tree that I marked in my mind for the lions? And we were sleeping next to the termite mine just up ahead. Right, while we try to see if these lions have moved or not, let's go to Taylor, who has finally arrived at the Wahlberg's Eagle Nest. Now, you can see a nest at the bottom left-hand side of your screen. However, I don't think that that's the Wahlberg's Nest. But here, everybody, is one of the pale morph Wahlberg Eagles. Now, we're not far from that nest. We are, are about, about 200 meters, according to a downpour Dave. So this could most definitely be the same eagle, or one of the one of the, the eagles from, from the nest that we are so familiar with. Maybe it's just been flying around looking for that terrapin. Off it goes everybody. Perhaps it's on its way back to the nest. Should we go around to the nest? Let's go around to the nest everybody. You can see it there. Ah oh, cool that is. Take us, lead us to the nest. Maybe we'll be able to follow this Wahlberg's eagle back home. Wouldn't that be quite amazing? Now you can just see a silhouette of it at the moment. Flying over, and I think that's exactly where it's going. What do you think, Dave? Uh, I, agree. I think it's going to take us to the nest. Let's go around. We're not far, and I heard some more branches breaking. But now I'm not hoping for these elephants because these elephants are making me very sad. We can just hear them, but we can't see them. They're taunting us. Hello, Wahlbergs. You are really beautiful flying up above us right now, but you won't be able to see. Where's the nest? Don't worry, down poor Dave knows where the nest is, so he's going to take us. Just need to pull my hat down, everybody. Sorry, it's about to fly off due to this wonderful wind. It feels like it's the Eastern Cape today. We're we going straight. Oh no, we're we going right. Okay, we'll be there in just a little bit. As we're going past, can we have a look at that uh, big boor bean again? Now, this one, you see it's another boor bean tree, that tree that had the lovely red flowers. However, this one doesn't have any flowers just yet. Can you see that? Nothing? This is going to be quite a nice one, I think, when it does get some flowers. Another one to keep an eye out for. It'll be a good birding spot uh, once this big one does. This is much larger than the one we had earlier this morning. And, and it just depends on the type of elephants. Finally, everybody. Oh my goodness, I'm getting so distracted. But we have found the elephants. Look at them. So they were in the drainage line, everybody. That's exactly where they've been hiding. And there seems to be quite a few of them. Now it's obviously very difficult to go down there and we don't like to off-road for elephants for safety purposes and there's no need to squash the vegetation when we can see them right over here. However, what I might do is, Dave, I think I'm going to go forward for you a little bit because I've got a very clear view. So let's, I'm just going to go a fraction further forward. How's that? Is that better? There we go. Now you can see the whole elephant. Oh, and I almost fell out. We should lock the door. And they're just here munching away. Like I said, it's it's windy now. It started off being a beautiful day, not a breeze. It's very hot though. And we all know that the elephants don't particularly enjoy the wind, as do the, the rhinos and the buffalo and the zebra and the impala. 
they all prefer to stay out of the wind so feeding in a drainage line is a very good idea and I suspect that this wind is only going to get stronger so be prepared for a very windy afternoon I may not be able to wear my hat if this wind keeps up they're very quiet I can't tell you how many are in this herd unfortunately they're all spread out but I've seen about six so far you'll see there's a nice little breeding herd that we've got but we've been hearing branches breaking and all sorts of trumpeting going on so possibly there's quite a few of them spread out in this area I'm so happy about that see what I said it's been amazing these this last 150 meters I don't think we've gone any more than and than that much I'm gonna go back again so we can get another view of the other elephants that one's coming out but I think if I go back you can just hear them everywhere Rusty, reverse please. Yeah, oh, thank you. Going to reverse. No, Rusty needs a talking to. There we go. Can you see them? You can see them. There's a few trees in the way, but you can see that there's a, three elephants over there. And I definitely think they are all spread out. It's a nice shady spot to actually, as well to have a little siesta just under that jackalberry tree. You can see them hiding away. And the lovely shade looks like a big female on that you can just see peering out on the right and I think a male and her um, two two youngsters the one on the one that's sort of in the middle looks like it could be a boy it's quite difficult to tell from here and then this one looks like it could be a female it looks like it's got a very sharp head and also secreting from the temporal gland I don't know if you can see that it's difficult because the trees are in the way now at that young that size of an elephant an elephant bull shouldn't be really secreting from his uh, temporal glands oh I suppose he could if he was maybe uh, stressed they could do that but it's the very sharp angled head looks like another female I can't see what they're eating but the three of them have found something there that's obviously quite delicious got thorns ah you look like an acacia and that explains it if it is an acacia now I've been trying to count how many elephants are in this herd and unfortunately Haley, I cannot see how many there are they seem to be all spread out I can see six though but behind lots of trees I don't know if you'll be able to get a good view of them and I can hear some more now a breeding herd of elephants can be anywhere from five elephants right through to 30 elephants and typically you don't see a, one family sort of more than a, anywhere between 30 and 40 elephants that's quite a big breeding herd but you do see families coming together however so that's when you see 150 elephants or 200 elephants it's normally more than one family group that have joined together and are going on a search for a greener pastures we saw that a lot down in the south actually there was this group of elephants and it was actually three different groups that we used to see on a regular basis and the reason why I know this is because all the each there was one or two uh, there were three or four sorry female elephants that had identifying features like the one tusk was quite interesting it sort of grew straight down to the ground and then bent backwards so bent back towards the elephant there was another one that had uh, a big uh, split straight through her ear and they all had these different features and and this was sort of like one elephant from each of the family groups and they ended up joining up it was quite interesting and they would go into Kruger because we'd see them coming back with all the lovely red sand and then they would come north into the, the southern sector of the Sabi Sands and then they would go all the way north and then a few weeks later we'd see them again coming from Kruger and they were just doing loops and loops and loops there were about a hundred of them that uh, ended up hanging together just searching for, for food it was quite amazing and you could see them there again stripping the bark and I always find that in, in the summer months uh, the elephant's tusks are normally quite black quite gray in color now we see that because they're having lots and lots of mud baths to keep themselves nice and cool but then you can also see them in winter with darkened tusks but normally it's not really from having the mud baths though they do but only on exceptionally hot days 
and it's like almost like a complete opposite because they're sticking their tusks into the ground trying to dig for the roots in the bottom of the trees but very dirty tusks and I suspect so keep an eye out on a dam the dam cam um, throughout the morning because it is very warm and possibly we're going to get a few elephants going down there to have a little drink or to cool themselves down to have a little a little wallow that would be very nice very happily just feeding there so they seem to be slowing down for the morning now they do a lot of feeding during the night and they actually carry on eating for about 19 hours every single day can you imagine for eating 19 hours a day and not worrying about what you look like it would be amazing so these elephants will do that but typically when it gets very very hot and like I said it's getting warm now they'll find a nice shady patch obviously it's got to be a tree big enough with lots of lots of leaves to, to provide some shade for a big elephant and then they'll have a little siesta I've just seen some more elephants come out into the drainage so it's quite a big herd I've just seen another two elephants come down so we're on eight and I suspect that there are still more to come But it's beautiful here. Right, I know we're looking at these elephants, but I very quickly want to go to this Warburg's Eagle's Nest. We're probably only about, how far would you say, 50 meters away? Uh, a little bit. A little bit more, right everyone. Let's very quickly go to this Warburg's Eagle's Nest because I am intrigued and I want to see what's going on. So we're going to leave our lovely friends, the elephants, bye-bye. And hopefully we'll be able to find them again this afternoon and spend a bit more time with them. But let's very, very quickly, quickly go to the Wahlberg's Eagle's Nest. I'm racing. Are we going to make it? Are we going to make it down for Dave? I think so. Okay, I'm going everybody. Hold on tight. I don't know why I'm holding onto my steering wheel so tight. I'm not actually going that fast. <laughs> okay, almost, almost, almost. I think we're going to make it. Woo! That's a bit quick. Sorry, Dave. Right. <laughs> we're getting there, everybody. How far? How much further? Let's go another hundred. No, I don't know if we're going to make it, everybody, but I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying my absolute best. Lots of wind. I can't even hear myself talk anymore. So I hope you're still hearing me. Woo! Bumpity bum. Let's not try and lose. Are we there yet? No. I don't know if we're going to make it. Okay, everybody. I don't think we're going to make it. But let's have a last look at these little elephants. It has been a, a wonderful morning spent with all of you and i hope you've had a fantastic day and uh, remember to tune in this afternoon for the sunset safari and we'll follow up on the Wahlberg's eagle goodbye everybody i'll leave you with the elephants